CEO of TPA Global. I'm here with Federico, uh, Maria, and Yarif, um, all TPA Global members. Uh, um, Federico is in Italy and uh, Yarif in Israel. Uh, Mary and me are in the boardroom in Amsterdam. We would like to present to you today the uh, how to deal with your 2020 TP documentation, especially what you can still be doing in the months of November and December to get everything uh, on COVID-related uh, adjustments into your general ledger uh, this year, rather than uh, having to clear it in your documentation for 2020 next year. So that's the theme of today's conference. Uh, we will be very practical and also give you different angles to uh, the changes in, in your strategy business model Unsurprising model and benchmarking approach, which uh, all four layers will carry different layers of uh, other trails required to defend yourself, especially your COVID-19 adjustments to uh, various tax authorities. Before we start diving into the, um, uh, the, the change in strategy by your company, the change in business model, change in transurprising system without changing the business model and the change in benchmarking. We will address um, the two themes first, uh, which act as a reference point for the, 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 the tax authorities as well as uh, us. What are the OECD and country references on COVID-19 adjustments? And um, going back to the heart of the matter, what would third parties do? We have a few slides on that as well. So with that, I would like to move uh, to the next slide and give the floor to Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to those joining us from US. Uh, a small reminder, you can always uh, ask questions in the question box, uh, and we would be answering uh, either on the way or at the end of our webinar. Uh, so, as you all know, OECD guidelines, especially uh, after changes in 2017, uh, do provide us uh, more economic references. Uh, and on your screen, you see now relevant paragraphs that we selected, which talk uh, basically about that the economic reality prevails uh, on the uh, actual on the contracts. It prevails uh, also on the uh, uh, setup terms uh, that you had before. So, if there are any changes to real economic circumstances, OECD guidelines do allow for the changes, uh, and which we would talk about later. And as such, uh, should be always used as a first point of reference uh, when you are uh, doing your adjustments, talking to tax authorities, drafting your internal memos, uh, and etc. Yeah, with that, uh, I think the the, the twenty. 17 guidelines have uh, broken away from uh, what we used to have. We used to have legal agreement is, is leading uh, unless uh, there is a significant deviation in the conduct of parties. Um, here we're um, looking at uh, a fractional difference um, will turn you in favor of the economic reality. So with that, I think we can move to the uh, next slide, uh, Federico, you want to take it away on uh, Australia and uh, Singapore? Right. So good afternoon to everyone. So there are no, there has been limited guidance currently from local tax authorities to assist taxpayers in uh, um, address the impact of COVID-19 on their uh, transfer pricing outcome. So the Australian Tax Taxation Office was one of the first tax authorities to release specific guidance. Uh, the guidance set out the ATO expectation around the analysis that will be required to taxpayer to support the transfer pricing position in the pandemic time. Uh, so in particular, that the Australian Taxation Office specified that it will be necessary to provide a functional analysis, a fair analysis, before and after COVID-19 in order to give evidence about uh, uh, any change in the functional risk profile of the taxpayer. 
a description of the economic circumstances outlining the, the actual economic impact of the pandemic on the Australian operation. So it is really important to provide a, a broad uh, analysis of the industry. Uh, the, to the description of the contractual arrangements between the Australian entity and its related parties. Of course, if there are any uh, material uh, obligation or material terms or condition variants, um, an evidence of any impact of COVID on the specific products or services offered by the Australian entities and how this change has affected the financial results and an evidence of resulting changes in business strategy. This is from a qualitative point of view. view. So from a quantitative standpoint, the, the Australian Taxation Office recognizes that there are some limitations and difficulties in obtaining available uh, benchmarking and comparable companies. So for, uh, for this reason, the, the guidance uh, uh, specify that taxpayer may may adopt a but for test in supporting their transfer pricing outcomes in the current environment. So the ATO will seek to understand the financial outcome taxpayer would have achieved but for the impact of COVID-19. This analysis may include a detailed profit and loss analysis showing changes in revenue and expenses with an explanation of variances attributable to the pandemic. For example, a variance analysis of budget versus actual results. A details uh, of profitability adjusted uh, in order to show uh, how the COVID-19 has uh, it have impacted the, the profit and loss situation. The, the rationale and evidence for any increased allocation of cost or reduction of sales, and any evidence of uh, any government assistance provided or affecting the Australia or operation. So it's really push on to this guidance. Uh, Australian taxpayers are expected to undertake a, a relevant align, analysis, diving, diving deeper into the economic impacts on their business, and in particular, on the impact of COVID-19 on their operation. Uh, moving to the, to the next, next slide, uh, the same approach was adopted by uh, Inland uh, Revenue Authorities of Singapore. So, more or less, the information required in the TP documentation are the same. It's really important to uh, point out the approach uh, suggested by IRNAs in relation to how to test the intercompany transaction. This is because uh, the IRS um, allows for uh, uh, the application of a term testing approach. Typically, taxpayers, Singapore taxpayers are expected to undertake an annual testing of TP outcomes to analyze whether uh, these TP arrangements with related parties meet the arm length principle. So, for example, the financial year data for the year 2020 is, uh, has to be compared with the financial data of the comparable company for the prior year, generally for the years from 2017 to 2019. Uh, for financial year 2020, the IRS recognized that a single year testing uh, will be being impacted by COVID since the financial result of the Singapore taxpayer is uh, impacted, will be impacted by COVID-19 while the, the data, the financial data of comparable companies will not be reflective of COVID-19. For such, for such reason, the IRS has proactively granted a one-time special concession to taxpayer, and now they can apply multiple year testing 
without prior consultation with the um, IRS. So, for example, for Singapore taxpayer for 2000, for financial year 2020, it will be possible to compare the three years period 2018, 2020 with the same period or, or with the period 2017 to 2019 of the comparable company. This use of uh, the use of term testing will likely help taxpayer with the reduction of uh, TP adjustment. Another important point is the uh, discussion about the, the APA, so the Advanced Pricing Agreement, and uh, the, uh, both the Australian Taxation Office and the Inland Revenue Authority of Singapore uh, demonstrate its, their intention to be open for discussion, and uh, they will engage with taxpayer to assess the impact of COVID-19 or their existing APAs as well as ongoing application. So if taxpayers are not impacted by COVID-19, they can continue with the APA proposal as usual. Uh, on the other side, if tax taxpayers uh, were impacted by COVID-19, it's really important to uh, have a discussion with the tax authorities and understand if some of the key critical assumptions be behind the DPA as well as the key terms or the condition of the DPA uh, were in, uh, have been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the same approach uh, could be used uh, in order to mitigate the tax risk deriving from COVID-19. So, uh, for example, for tax year 2020, an idea, an approach could be to uh, discuss with the tax, local tax authorities the uh, possible activation of an advanced pricing agreement in order to mitigate the tax risk for this year and for the future years. So. So oh, the two uh, slides that, that we discussed are just an example of local tax authorities' guidance, and we will wait for future uh, guidance by the other local tax authorities, as well as uh, a work, a separate work by the OECD before the, the year end. Uh, Federico, thank you. Uh, we have a question from our audience. Uh, should the year-end uh, transfer pricing calculations include an adjustment for the local government COVID assistance that may have been received? Sorry, in your you the question? The local the, the, the transfer pricing adjustment? So the adjustments at the year-end, should they uh, include the uh, benefit that you received from the government uh, because of COVID? So, for example, uh, some plants and Netherlands did receive uh, governmental benefit uh, for for the closing how like how this should be approached in the year end transfer pricing calculation should you include it or not ah okay clear so uh, i think that this depend also on for example i i can give you uh, a, 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 an idea on what the generally tax italian tax authorities try to do so this is of course an uh, exceptional uh, case so an extraordinary uh, item so uh, I think that uh, it's something that we need to, to consider it separate uh, because of course th this is an effect of the, the COVID but uh, it's something that, uh, different from the, the application transfer pricing policies. Yeah, um, uh, Frederico, if I may, the, the approach could be twofold uh, to complement your, uh, uh, your, your answer. Uh, if you have a routine type of operations in a country and you receive a subsidy by the government, so assuming you don't need to pay it back, uh, which sometimes happens as well uh, on wages, uh, subsidies and, and grants, but assume you don't need to pay it back, so you had a hundred of costs 
uh, now because you get plenty uh, compensated, you only have 80 of cost. Uh, and if you are a performing a routine function for a principal somewhere else, uh, the, the uh, temptation obviously is there to say, okay, I have not 100 plus 10 uplift is 110. And now I only have 80 cost plus 10 percent is 88 as the intercompany service charge. So, so that's one story board. If on the other side you're the entrepreneur, you're the principal in, in the structure, obviously uh, the uh, subsidy uh, you get to compensate your OPEX uh, is, is meant in most uh, cases. Uh, uh, there's criteria. One of the criteria a lot of governments give the grounds on is a 20% or higher drop in sales. Uh, so your OPEX is, is proportionately uh, compensated uh, to a drop or an anticipated drop in sales. So that, that I think is uh, then the answer should you include it. Uh, according to me, you should because it's a, it's a negative cost. Yeah. Okay, um, as you can see, from uh, what uh, Frederico just uh, illustrated through Singapore and Australia, a, a lot of the criteria the tax authorities throw at us are um, very closely related to a multitude of uh, business restructuring uh, uh, criteria and audit trails. Uh, so if, if you look at, at COVID-19 from a, a, a tax revenue perspective, a tax government's perspective, then you see multiple restructurings, uh, changes of uh, channels, et cetera, happening at the same time. All of them are micro business restructurings in the in the light of uh, of section uh, section nine of the uh, 2017 guidelines. Um, an important question uh, on on transpising is always what would third parties do, and that's the next slide. Um, before. The, the BEPS reports were finalized. The uh, OEC had invited a professor who has written a book, Peter Bogotoft, and uh, one of his colleagues uh, on design of production contracts. And, and they, they uh, asked that professor, can you explain in the book you've published how third parties actually negotiate with each other and what is the role of contracts and how does sometimes conduct uh, 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 override contracts or the other way around so that parties, although the conduct is different, they tend to uh, lean towards the contract. And what do parties do if there's no contract? So, so all these things are described in this uh, nice little booklet, uh, Design of Production Contracts, um, where uh, uh, Peter Bogotov and his colleagues were uh, applying a econometric model to. Uh, the heart of the matter, which is uh, what, what is on this slide, is that in a lot of cases, contract three theory, so what you put on a piece of paper as being the contract, is not 100% in line with the contract practice. So how people uh, apply the uh, terms and conditions vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. So uh, the, the design of production contracts um, describes mostly how farmers interact with the next uh, step in the chain, which is processing units. So a farmer of pigs or peas is uh, being compared in its interaction with the processing uni uh, unit, uh, pro processing these peas and these pigs, uh, and, and uh, have what Peter and his colleague uh, have analyzed is what is the behavioral, what is the conduct of parties in, in all these situations. So paper is great, but it's uh, just a, another way of uh, putting multiple decisions on a, uh, a piece of paper, huh? which is basically it's a, a we view contract design as a multi-criteria decision-making problem. Uh, and that means there are so many layers and there's so many complexities uh, simply a, pro a, a contract cannot capture unless it's a very American style, very long and, and, and big uh, contract. Uh, but that immediately moves you to the, the, the question, what is then the, the goal hierarchy in analysis for specific pro uh, uh, contracts? And, and 
he has given a very nice table where he says the integrated profit, in this case by the farmer and the processing units, is being managed by uh, together coordinating the production and coordinating uh, the risk. Well, coordination also means communication about who is actually going to bite the bullet on what type of risks, uh, what is happening if the production levels uh, are uh, below the anticipated budgeted uh, volumes. Um, so that's the hierarchy uh, to start with uh, by managing the integrated profit between two third parties. Then the next thing is the motivational issue. So they say uh, if conduct of parties wants to uh, run sustainable business for many, many years, and typically farmers and processing units are almost bound to be married or, or engaged one way or the other, that's, that's a, a, a fact of life, you need to put the right motivational, uh, um, motivational triggers in to keep enough participation uh, and enough uh, focus on efforts and who is actually uh, investing and getting a return on it. So the motivational aspect is second in the hierarchy to look at a contract. Um, last but not least is also that uh, third parties would always try to cut out agency costs from contracts. Uh, so they try to avoid conflicts. Uh, they they uh, are monitoring these transactional costs and try to influence, influence these costs downwards. So this gives you a pretty good feel. And, and Peter was invited to explain to the OECD parties who were writing these batch reports and who have based on uh, pre presentations like this, uh, where Peter really could tell what third parties are doing. Uh, th that's a, sort of been the inspiration of the OECD to um, um, come up with this uh, conduct of parties prevailing over intercompany agreements if the, the two deviate. Okay, so this is what third parties are doing as an illustration. Uh, the next slide, uh, Maria, you want to take forward the industry? Yeah. So, as you all know, uh, though COVID did impact uh, economy overall, it did impact different industries in a different way. So, uh, one of the most obvious examples is that airline uh, industry was impacted heavily because they really had to stop. Uh, while uh, some of the industries, for example, uh, those that are internet providers, I think they're thriving because uh, people need the connection more than ever. Uh, so this all needs to be taken into account uh, when uh, doing the analysis of uh, COVID impact. So as such, you cannot just claim that was COVID and that's why I need to do an adjustment, but you need to look at your peers and how uh, your industry was impacted uh, by the loss of sales uh, by simply uh, no ability to work and produce goods or no ability to move goods around uh, and then take this all into account for your analysis and maybe do certain sensitivities. For example, uh, if you are selling uh, several different types of goods, uh, so if you are, let's say, a reseller uh, of uh, electronics but also fast-moving goods, you need to see uh, how this combination of these two industries uh, would work and do certain sensitivity analysis in order to make your analysis, uh, analysis bulletproof to tax authorities. Yeah, point of, of attention is uh, sort of a nice uh, uh, visual and radar view. Uh, the, the, the picture on top is from an uh, insurance company, but the radar view does give coronavirus impact uh, per industry on, on various levels. Uh, so what is the impact on personnel on, on the supply chain, on the revenue side. And I think you see the usual suspects coming up. Very important uh, to uh, make it country or region specific if you want to uh, play the card vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tax uh, authorities. Yeah. Right. Yeah, next slide. There we go. You uh, want to yeah. take it away? Yeah. So it's quite clear that COVID-19 
as forever changing our experience as customers, as employees, as uh, citizens, as also our our behaviors are changing uh, as a result. So uh, the pandemic has changed uh, uh, not only how people work, but also uh, also how people uh, shop, eat, and uh, as well as the basic pattern of, of movement and travel. So now business needs to understand how this world affect all the touch points in the customer. So for this reason, uh, one of the uh, most relevant effects of the pandemic was the um, an accelerated digital transformation. Uh, some CEO of the tech big giants declared that over the last few months, we have seen years long digital transformation roadmaps compressed into weeks in order to adapt to the new normal as a result of COVID-19. Uh, some data shows that uh, COVID uh, accelerated companies' digital uh, transformation strategy by an average of, of six years. So uh, we have seen during the last um, few months uh, different uh, strategy used by the companies, by the multinational companies to challenge the, the pandemic. One of the strategies strategy was to offer the same products through different channels. For example, the uh, through an online channel. Uh, uh, just to give you an example of that I saw online, a Chinese cosmetic company was forced to close 40% of its stores, including all of its location one. Sales went down by 90%. So the company redeployed its beauty advisor as online influencers, leveraging uh, digital tools uh, such as WeChat to engage customers virtually and drive online sales. Uh, and on a Valentine's Day, uh, launched a, a large-scale live stream shopping event, events uh, featuring more than 100 uh, influencers. So 100 advi one advisor sales in just two hours equal equaled the sales of four retail stores. So the company's February 2020 February sales in comparison with the same sales of the of the of the same month in 2019 um, claimed 120 uh, percent. So. Uh, one of the strategy is to uh, go fast to the digitalization. Uh, the second strategy was to offer different products using the same infrastructure. So COVID-19 is dampening the demand for many products and services, uh, resulting in, in, a, in an underutilization of organizational infrastructure. So factories for example, run under capacity, restaurants, bar, hotel, uh, hotels sit empty. So while the need for some products and services has fallen, uh, demand for other uh, products and services is high and even growing. Uh, so some organizations are taking advantage of this shift by deploying existing infrastructure to produce different products or to offer new types of services. Just to give you an example, car manufacturers such as General Motors and Ford have modified some production line, lines to manufacture a medical device like uh, ventilators. Uh, then we are experiencing some uh, changes, of course, in the, in the supply chain. And so we have, uh, so we saw also a, a different operation of business restructuring. So uh, before uh, COVID-19, uh, multinational uh, companies were already facing increased attention on supply chain management due to other factors, such as uh, technological disruption, national uh, protectionist measures, uh, climate changes policy, and global tax uh, changes. Uh, now, of course, COVID is uh, it's created a sudden, unexpected supply chain uh, disruption, and, and we are experiencing some uh, 
business restructuring or temporary business restructuring just to uh, challenge in the near term the impact of COVID-19 or a long-term business restructuring uh, with a relocation function abroad. Uh, for example, just uh, uh, thinking about the production, uh, we saw that um, company responses to uh, COVID challenges was uh, uh, limited at the beginning to the movement of final operation uh, that determined the origin of goods. Uh, now, oh, facing with the current crisis, companies are uh, relearning what happens when, they, when you cannot get the raw materials, the components, and all the uh, necessary products to, to, to make the, the, the product. So to counter this kind of risk, it's likely that more companies will build uh, redundancy at all phases of the supply chain through region specific chains. So, Federico, yeah. We're conscious of time, can you uh, see whether you can move on? Because I think we're, we're, we're otherwise uh, getting stuck uh, and there might be some questions coming up. Okay. So uh, I think that uh, with reference to production, the, the, the trend that we will uh, see in the next future are production near shoring and the next generation manufacturing. So with uh, using, I don't know, for example, uh, digitalization and new technology. Uh, the last point of the, this slide is related to the, to the financing. So of course, the, the the economic downturn may lead multinational companies to reassess their existing intercompany financing arrangement and to devise appropriate tax structure for cash and uh, liquidity management. So uh, we think that, that there will be a strong need for intra-group funding and uh, parental cross-guarantee on third-party lending. So uh, as, you, as we will see in the next slide, there are a lot of different consequences from a transfer pricing point of, of point of view that we'll analyze in the next slides. Very good. Uh, thanks, uh, Federico. Um, th yeah, th th these these changes in business model and strategy with the minimum model trail, which is fairly straightforward. Uh, now we move to change of transfer pricing system without changing the business model. Um, uh, Yarif, uh, are you on a good line uh, for... Yes, I, I hope so, up? do I? Very good. Go ahead. Excellent, thank you. So, um, taking into account what I've been said uh, so far, um, it's actually the, the basic question is always what would third parties do because this is actually the arm's length challenge. Um, so, if we're taking uh, all of that into actual transfer pricing, so we need to speak about, first of all, about uh, routine function, cost center, expense center, and ask ourselves also, should the limited risk entity, and please note that we didn't write a limited risk distributor necessarily, but limited risk entity, LRE, which mean that uh, could be a distributor, a service provider, maybe a licensee. It all depends how we identified uh, and characterize the functions as the risk uh, when we did our mm. first transfer of pricing and updated it following facts and circumstances. So if we have a limited risk entity, usually the tested that we are measuring how much profit should be left, whether it's a cost plus or operating margin or royalties or whatever, the question should be here following everything that was said so far is whether the limited entity continue yeah. to receive stable profit for the routine function in the current crisis because we can't avoid what's going on and then that it takes us again to what what third parties uh, do um and uh, and we'll see an example in a couple of uh, minutes and maybe there's no risk at all i mean maybe it's even below the limited risk so is that equal to taxable profit at all the taxpayers 
also when taking into account the intercompany agreement that has been discussed so far can say all right so if an agreement would have been signed with a third party definitely or maybe or, or at least we will check maybe we can invoke the force majeure here and say all right so these are facts this is, this is in fact the force majeure because of the COVID-19 maybe yes maybe not it's, it depends on the agreement so the same thing with third parties also applies to the intercompany agreement within the group so we can always say and try uh, to claim that something very unusual happens here and we'll see examples uh, so we can invoke the first measure and not uh, comply with some of the contractual obligation that we signed. This also goes with the APAs that uh, Stefan Federico already uh, discussed, because when we negotiated the APA first uh, with the tax authority, and that was uh, probably, uh, unless we're talking about uh, APAs right now, that was probably way before the COVID-19 crisis meaning that we negotiated on a regular basis with our regular facts and circumstances but now APA is an agreement we negotiated an agreement we decided the agreement it's a prayer ruling for transfer pricing so as uh, it was said before me we have to see maybe the existing APA should be terminated or maybe updated we should speak with the tax authorities and examine the APA if it works also on a crisis uh, period. Regarding government subsidy, I think uh, that was uh, discussed. Um, and I also agree with the fact uh, that uh, we shouldn't exclude them um, from uh, uh, the adjustment uh, because this is, has to do, this is in line with what's happening in the crisis, the subsidies. So I think it should calculate it appropriately, but we should take that into account. The commentation is very important in this regard because if you would like to do a change in your transfer pricing system without changing necessarily your business uh, system, then you need to document what happened to see um, what happened with an extraordinary events or decision. And look here below, there's a uh, uh, we, 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 we are moving between extraordinary decision and extraordinary events example if we're talking about decision decision is closure of plants or modifying channel of sales um, and from cell stores in order to save money to experience centers maybe and shift of production location but that comes from actually events sometimes because extraordinary events like significant reduction of sales could lead to the decision of closure of plant. So, and restriction on supply chain logistics, and of course, double office cost can uh, also lead to imposed cost saving also for routine activities. So in the end of the day, when we are documenting, I think Marie also discussed that when we are documenting our, or let's say transfer pricing documentation through year 2020, uh, because fiscal year 2019 hasn't dealt with COVID-19 and 2020 definitely uh, does, then uh, we need to document the extraordinary, extraordinary events and extraordinary decision and to show what happens in our special, unique industry and to see how we were affected and how is that affecting our transfer pricing. And uh, we can move to the next slide, please. All right, so this, I think, illustrates quite well uh, a quantitative example of a distribution company uh, doing adjustment. This is a quite simple example, but it actually uh, illustrates uh, the need to think it over when performing such a thing. So let's say we have company X uh, that it's the subsidiary, the LRD, the low risk distributor, buying from the IP holder, the entrepreneur, the process owner and selling uh, its product uh, to third parties. So uh, we are analyzing actually the PL for fiscal year 2020, which is the COVID 19 times. And let's say this company was affected uh, by the COVID 19. Let's say it's like the hotel business or airline or, uh, or a retail or whatever that was definitely affected. And we saw example for that. So the company uh, purchased 
the products from the uh, from the entrepreneur from the IP holder and sales to third parties were 150 million dollars the cost of goods sold which actually means in this case the transfer pricing because this is a distributor is not manufacturing anything the cost of goods sold which is the transfer pricing which means the price that uh, this company was paying to the entrepreneur of which it uh, purchased the products uh, from was $85 million, which led to a gross margin, of course, of $65 million. And in percentage, we're talking about about 43%. Well, uh, of course, there are SGNA operational expenses, uh, in this case, in the example, $58 million, which are 38 uh, 30.67%, which leads to an operating profit of $7 million. And if we are talking about a percentage, or in other words, operating margin, we are talking about 4.67%. Now, this company has done a transfer pricing study for an LRD using uh, the CPM method in the States or the TNMM method elsewhere. And the results was an arm length transfer pricing rate that uh, start from a lower quartile of 2.3% to an upper quartile of 4.18%. And the median was determined to be 3.26%. Now, a decision has to be made. Which part of the PL to adjust? Obviously, the tested party, the company, is, the, is above the range because the upper quartile is 3.26% and the actual results are 4.67%. So we need to adjust and we have two options here. One option on a regular basis is to adjust to the median, for example. So if we adjust to the median, which is 3.26%, that means that the operating profit should be instead of 7%, only $4,890,000. If we do that, the adjustment would be about $2 million. But again, we are in a COVID-19 time. So we have to think the company has to decide whether it was affected by the COVID-19 and the company has documented the reasons uh, for doing a much more aggressive adjustment going to the lower quarter in this case, only because of the COVID-19, let's say for this example. If the company has the facts and circumstances like we illustrated before, then the company can choose instead of adjusting to the median of the range, the company can adjust to the lower part of the range, which is 2.3%. And if that would be the case, then instead of doing an adjustment for $2 million, the adjustment would be $3.5 million and more profit probably, well, necessarily will go to the entrepreneur. So we see in this case a very simple example of a quantity of an LRD adjustment that for the first time, uh, circumstances and thinking of COVID-19 of the crisis area are taking place. We can move to the next slide, and I think, Steph, you can take it from there. Okay, um, here we, we see maybe an, an, another angle to uh, COVID. Uh, suddenly your uh, IP you were already planning or not to be transferred or centralized in, in one location. Um, it could be an optimum timing to move it now because there might be uh, value um, uh, restrictive uh, in, in impact. Simply, the value might be a lot less than what you had in mind before. So there's two valuation techniques on IP re retrospective. So you see, for example, in Switzerland, there's a whole host because of the special regimes being abolished. There's a whole host of companies uh, who are up for an, an impairment of their business uh, and their IP if they stay as a principal in Switzerland, uh, that typically looks at two years in the past and one year in the future. So it takes a retrospective effect. Question is obviously in a COVID situation is um, is last year really representative to do evaluation or should you take uh, an, another uh, past year to uh, to base your um, your financials on to do the valuation in the first place? 
or you take a more prospective approach where the sensitivity of the industry and your own company to COVID is obviously very, uh, very much will impact the numbers. Um, and, and even if the crisis is challenging uh, the very survival of the company, obviously uh, maybe uh, uh, transferring IP uh, could be uh, not so much the preferred options in the first place. So if you if you look at how that all works out in terms of uh, valuation, if we go to the next slide, and we are uh, actually looking at uh, um, a situation where turnover of people who use this IP uh, is a million, one and a half million up uh, projected uh, uh, to to really have a healthy growth rate. Um, royalty on IP is five. Dumpy costs assume to be 50. So you get an EBIT on the IP, which is discounted factor of 10, gives you 180 of uh, value, is, uh, whether it's 180,000 or 180 million, doesn't really matter. If COVID strikes, then obviously your outlook on revenue might not be that big. Maybe the industry you're in suddenly uh, has a negative impact on the royalty rate you can charge even to third parties and your dampy costs will not go uh, down that easily because you still need a whole team to run your dampy functionality. So let's assume it's 60%. You see the immediate impact on, uh, on, on IP with a discount factor of 15 because you're suddenly a more risky uh, investment object to, to put your money in. And so, so, so here the question is, should I consider transferring the, the, the IP in this particular case this year or wait for more reliable financials? Uh, that's, that's sort of the name of the game. So suddenly COVID-19 becomes an opportunity to um, be uh, looking into your IP and where it is currently in the group and where you would like it to land in uh, one or two years from now or even today. Uh, move it uh, in the in the months of November and December based on, on uh, similar uh, financial representation as in this slide. Um, if there's any questions, please raise them. Um, we will now go to the next slide. Um, yeah, financial transactions. Uh, I, I think we already addressed it. Uh, I think uh, Federico uh, already indicated uh, in the case of uh, Singapore and Australia that there's a very high likelihood of financial arrangements. So where, uh, which um, instruments, equity or debt instruments do we actually use to finance our company? And how do we dress up the cash box uh, with the treasury activities uh, we see a lot of uh, companies uh, who need to um, uh, restructure or re-address the whole setup of their treasury operations. And the examples are, are very clear. Huh? The, there's different, uh, different cases of loss financing required in, in groups which are in the wrong industries. Uh, supplier credits uh, dry up, uh, customer credits uh, are, are extended. Uh, means a sort shortage of working capital. It means your own treasury needs to bring up uh, more working capital for you to to survive. So here uh, again, the change of transferring system may, uh, requires a sensitivity analysis, but also applying a holistic approach to the group's value chain. Uh, I.e., your business model might not have changed, but the relative contribution of the actors in the chain might have changed uh, simply because of the changing market around you. Um, modified treasury activities, and, and don't forget to explain uh, how, why you're changing your transfer pricing system, why the business model is not. And so this comes back to Yari's um, um, slide where he compared extraordinary decisions, decisions taken by the multinational versus extraordinary events, they happen to you, and as a consequence, you need to step into the decision mode with enough audit trails. Um, just a, a very simple 
version of what can you change in financial transactions. So company A gives uh, gets third party loans in 2020 on the refinancing round. Uh, it had provided in 18 already a, a loan to uh, a company A2 and uh, the intercompany compensation to A1 consists of a margin spread as well as a return on equity at risk uh, type of component. So if, if we just zoom into the uh, and use the, the uh, CAPM model to calculate the return on equity, we basically see uh, that the, the data and the uh, interest in the market will uh, very likely be infected uh, by COVID-19. And as you can see from the calculation pre-COVID and COVID at the bottom of this page, uh, it takes a uh, risk-free 0.5, a beta of 0.9, uh, which meant your company was less uh, volatile compared to the industry other players uh, that might move up the needle. Also, your interest in the market might have gone up. And suddenly you're looking at an expected return on equity at risk, uh, which has uh, uh, gone up with 20%, which could be quite substantial. Uh, just simply benchmarking that in databases which still carry commercial loans from banks to corporates uh, who are not in dire straits, who are not in bankruptcy, who are not in a COVID crisis, obviously doesn't help you uh, to uh, move the needle. Okay, with that, I think we're moving to the benchmarks. Uh, Yarif, is that um, something you're picking up? Yes, uh, thank you. Just a uh, uh, very uh, short comment on the IP, of course, uh, about uh, what you said. So companies will have to, uh, again, to decide whether they're indeed transferring IP or wait for more finan more revival financial data or even waiting for the crisis to be over so that's indeed a challenging uh, decision and uh, we are experiencing experience it uh, right now uh, let's again uh, move to actual uh, tp implementation and go to change of benchmark used um, so transaction that can be reassessed like headquarter services licensing royalties um, R&D services and as a contract arrangement, and of course, global sourcing services. So let's start with what are we doing if we uh, picked up, for example, a profit method that requires the use of a database, an acceptable uh, database, whatever country uh, you're doing, and how to find the comparables to reflect your business under the COVID impacts. So first of all, um, if we are using in a lot of countries the current financial data, that exists uh, on the databases, that ne not necessarily means that this data already consists of the COVID, of the crisis uh, period, because uh, many of the databases and the companies have data for mostly end of 2019, maybe, maybe start of uh, 2020, and that's even before the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, began. So uh, what we can do is we can use, again, like a recent period, like a certain quarterly financial data that already uh, contains uh, <clears throat> contains data from uh, the COVID-19, if it's possible. Another option is limiting ourselves to a certain specific period downtown years only. For example, if we're taking uh, the crisis year of 2008 to 2009, and we're considering industry and market sensitive like airlines, hotel, and things uh, like that, we can say, again, after we documented everything we needed, that this is an example of, uh, of a crisis, of a downtown years, uh, of a uh, problem. So you're using data from uh, like uh, more than 10 years ago, but it reflects our industry. And we are expected to see also results that reflect our industry and the crisis. Another thing uh, that we may consider to do is the adjusting the comparable range because today, and also the adjustment example that I have been demonstrated, we are always using uh, the interquartile range, which is of course from the 25th percent to, 20, uh, to the 75th percentile, um, because this is the statistical uh, method that we are using. So in this case, in order to get results that uh, would be more, I would say, appropriate for the COVID-19 uh, impacts, we may consider to use 25th 
to 50 or even the full profitability range. Another very important thing is that when we are using benchmark, uh, for distributors, for low risk distributor who have to be profitable basically, but even more for routine service provider uh, that can cannot be in any circumstances in the loss position in a benchmark because this is in the contradict to the arm lengths. We are always uh, we are always eliminating loss making companies, and the reason for rejection is that they are loss making companies, so we can't use them as a routine service provider. But again, this is in time of uh, a crisis so we can consider losing uh, loss making companies because of course the crisis affects all the industry another thing we can do is applying lower remuneration to the limited uh, risk entities uh, like we did in the adjustment example i demonstrated but we can also consider a cost plus uh, zero uh, that has been used uh, in the last crisis 2008 and 9 cost plus zero actually means that we are only doing their embarrassment of expenses, which probably makes very sense if we explained it well in a time of a crisis. And of course, uh, and also we're connected to the last uh, thing that Steph has discussing of the IP, we can also modify uh, the working capital adjustment where it's higher or lower, depending on the circumstances. Let's move Thanks, to the next uh, yeah. slide. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're cautious of time and knowing people uh, yeah. might uh might be uh, uh, shifting to uh, to other people. So maybe go one back. Um, sorry, one back. So th this is a list of uh, actions uh, as uh, Yarif just explained. I think we will, uh, a question from one of you, we will share the slides. So this is more like a checklist on, on everything which was set before uh, uh, by Yarif uh, with a minimum auto trail uh, which you need to carry with you uh, to defend your COVID adjustments to tax authorities. If we move to the next slide, what, what, why, why now? That's the main question. Well, now you have the first dust has settled around COVID, so there is a, um, a possibility to work in your November, December books, uh, a general ledger of, uh, uh, so basically in your general ledger, uh, the COVID adjustments. If you choose to do COVID adjustments at the end of the year when the accounts were already closed and signed off by accountants or by other reference, uh, uh, then, then you lose the, um, the, the strong uh, layer of evidence that it has been worked into your book. So now the, the, the first dust is settling on the first wave and the second wave hopefully soon as well. Uh, you have better grip on what really COVID adjustment means for your industry, for your company. So uh, the, the collect data on change of strategy. That might not require lots of other trails. And the business model, mostly internal blueprints will be circulating. Make sure you lay your hands on it and, and use them as a base for your uh, adjustments in November and December with uh, very likely, uh, if, if possible, um, the, the retrospective impact of those COVID-19 adjustments uh, for, uh, starting at the beginning of the year, January 1. Um, let's take uh, the last slide uh, and then open the floor for any final comments. So simply set performance sensitivity analysis before and after, which makes it very similar to business restructuring. Find your evidence in the public domain now uh, before it's gone. Create these minimum audit trails as we've gone through them in case you change your business model. Second, uh, if we look at four, you change your TP system without changing your business model. And if you change the benchmarks used, I think the benchmark used is a lot of times pu published but I think you need to build it up according to the OCD guideline. Uh, another element is uh, optimize your tax impact on your TP system. We talked about the transfer of IP as one illustration and also perform benchmark studies, which do reflect the COVID-19 situation your industry is in. At all times, keep your economic reality. Now we're back to conduct of parties again, synced with your functional and contractual reality. So. 
uh, don't do adjustments which only reflect one of these realities. So simply said, if the conduct is uh, is uh, synced in your financials and and your contractual realities, you have the 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 what I call the magic triangle, which uh, easily is defendable, also in the in case of court uh, court cases and challenges. A health warning: the timing is critical if your book year is calendar year to make those adjustments in the general ledger and, and then later on document them in your FY 2020. Uh, don't forget to do that uh, because now is the time, the next two months, to actually achieve that, uh, that impact. Any final comments by Federico, Maria, um, Yarif? Okay, then thank you everybody for attending and we hope to see you in our next webinars. And if you still have questions, please uh, send it to us by email. We would be happy to answer. Thank you.